prefer more free form in this than I would if you just show up and throw up. But, but to me, it's not my style. Uh, I'm the director of the Wolf Center for Entrepreneurship. It's called the Wolf Center. Melvin Wolf, owner of Star Furniture, gave us four million bucks. He sold to Berkshire Hathaway. And so Melvin has been a real good promoter for us. For you not familiar, we, I have the number one ranked program in the country by Princeton Review uh, out of 2,400 plus different programs. Uh, so the University of Houston has a pretty big feather in its cap. Um, I started, we started now in Houston, over 270 businesses, over 7,000 employees. So we've done a really good job both locally as well as nationally. Um, and some of the who's who, I like businesses that don't make the Houston Business Journal, that don't make the Chronicle. Uh, we do quite a bit in real estate, um, both commercial, residential. I'll give you some examples I thought tonight of some of the residential real estate business ideas that have been tried, which is kind of an interesting way to try to garner both on the buy side and the sell side. And I'm going to go through some examples of some real businesses. I think for the first time in the history, for those of you not familiar with the University of Houston, of course, the big joke with guys like Jimmy and everybody else would be Cougar High and all that kind of story, because Jimmy's very insensitive. <laughs> I now do what's called, I monetize intellectual property. And I took, uh, I had five different teams this year. We won every business plan competition we were in. I just got back from the Department of Energy. We won the top prize in the nation. Woo. Uh, we were the top team out of the entire country. We beat MIT, Stanford, Harvard, University of Chicago, University of Texas, and all my teams are undergrad. Everyone else was PhDs and grads. Wow. So it was pretty cool. Very, very, it was a great feather in Houston's cap. Uh, my team uh, collectively this year won $380,000. We won the Rice uh, Clean Energy Prize. Um, so we're doing some great things over U of H. From a real estate point of view, it's been kind of interesting. Uh, University of Houston will soon have the second number with most students living on campus in the state of Texas. There will soon be 16,000 students living on campus which is changing dramatically the real estate demographic around the campus. Yes. So you're starting to see that I'm on the board of the East End Development District here. If you want the new hot spot of Houston, it's here. The East End. Because of proximity to downtown, there's been a 62% turnover in ownership of real estate. It's 98%, 95% Hispanic. But when the tax base starts to change, it's gonna force a lot of people moving. There's been a lot of real estate change hands down here, especially now that the train, although nobody rides it, it has a tendency to, to uh, gravitate towards development, as you all know. So this side of town is going to be the next, because of proximity, it's just sheer going uh, to be really, really interesting. You have El Tiempo Mexican restaurant, spent $3.2 million. Um, so they're, they're pretty bullish on what's going on, and they've just spent $24 million on Esplanade development, now navigation and all that around here. It's going to be uh, a real interesting changeover as to what happens, because people are going to get displaced, unfortunately. I do programs all around the country called Mind Your Own Business. I usually do a thing called Your Business at the Improv. I bring somebody out of the audience, I put them on the hot seat, and I rip them a new one, and everyone learns vicariously through that experience. We are not going to do that tonight. In our program, in my program, it's a year and a half, you can get a major. Uh, it's pretty doggone intense. Um, I get 250 people applying for 30 positions. Um, and it's, it's uh, very competitive and very difficult. But once in, it's just pretty amazing uh, what happens. We have this, the, the, my average starting salary from program people coming out of our program is now 73000 so that's the highest in the school. So it's really interesting. So I'm gonna go through some examples of some things that have been done. So let me just kind of get going here. So I'm all about this, turning passion into entrepreneurial success. I'm a serial entrepreneur. My largest company I had was 187 employees. I sold it to Ameritrade for $107 million. I raised $54 million from the Bass family in uh, Fort Worth. Uh, that was our largest gig, but I'm a real serial entrepreneur. I am not a PhD professor. Uh, I, 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 all, everyone in my program has met a payroll, so that's how 
how we operate. Um, so it's very, very practical. Uh, I have over 200 mentors in our program when people sign up for it. It works really, really well. I try to teach people how to think like an entrepreneur. I've had the, I have the country of Qatar coming in next week. I have Mississippi State, Texas A&M. Uh, we're now going to turn around and create an entrepreneurship mm -hmm. effort in the Texas Medical Center. Um, so a lot of really interesting things going on, but what are we busy? So here's my definition of entrepreneurship. And I'm not right, and this isn't wrong. It's my definition, and everybody can have their own. I like this definition because here's my entrepreneurial fantasy. I think you make money through scale, right? You figure out what you can do. You have an apartment complex, and you make scale because you're repeating revenue, right? That annuity street based revenue really, really works. So that's the mode, and that's called passive income. That's a wonderful way to go as long as your costs stay managed, right? Okay. So I want everyone in my organization to feel like an entrepreneur. I wanted to create an atmosphere all the time where on Sunday night you couldn't sleep because you couldn't wait to get to work on Monday morning. Now, in fact, you sprinted from your car to the office. Now, why can't we? Why do we have to call it work? In fact, today, the, the, the definition between work and play, there isn't one. I've been to Google's headquarters, I've been to Apple's, I've been to all of the leading edge. I was on the board of a company up in Seattle, very forward thinking. There is no, they're trying to move the borders between work and play such that it's just life. And this is what's happening. The average number of jobs a graduate has in their first, in fact, I'll ask you this question. How many jobs do you think the average graduate today has? after they graduate undergrad in, ten, in the first 10 years? Ten, three, five. Almost five and a half. It's separate employers. Right. Wow. Okay, there's no loyalty. There's no, no everybody's, you, you've got your office sitting right here. You've got your phone. You've got your calendar. You've got all your tools. It's changing the dynamic of how things work and what has to happen or not. I'm just with a guy who builds a lot of real estate on the east side of town here. He's doing a lot of another recycling scenario. Uh, and, and how we can get more revenue per square foot on what he's, what he's working on. It's really kind of an interesting scenario. So I'd ask you this question. If you had to compete against yourself, how would you kick your own If you had to go up against you, so for example, have you ever tried to call you? No, not for you. Sorry. Have you ever seen what that's like? Uh, so little things, right? Because how many real estate agents are there in Harris County? How many people in Harris County? Okay. So what sets one apart from the other? What makes somebody better than somebody else? Are they better looking? Are they more timely? Are they smarter? Do they have a better network? Do they have better friends that turn around and provide them either listings or opportunities? Are they better suited with banks and financing? Right? I consult to Boxer Properties. Boxer Properties, 100 million square feet. Do you know what those people have in their offices? Not one line of paper. There is not one piece of paper in that entire place. It is all automated. They are so reverse automated, you can't believe that. The owner in his office, six giant screens this size. And he can get down to the granular level on a per floor basis. You cannot believe the kind of analysis that they do and what their yield curve looks like on commercial real estate. It's just, it's a, I've never seen anything like it. It's unbelievable. This is what people are going to be up against. So when I say, how do you compete against yourself? I got news for you. Everybody's plotting to put your asses out of business. So how is it you continue to stay competitive and what is it that you do? That to me is what I do. Okay? I got entrepreneurship camp starting July 6th. I had 300 people apply for 30 positions, just for a camp, because everyone's looking for some sort of edge in the secret sauce, which really doesn't exist. So you got to understand your market, you got to understand your customer, you got to do competitive analysis, and you got to have the ability to pivot, meaning rotate, turn, revolve, swivel, spin, something quick. I'll give you an example. Most of you I know don't have any idea how the internet works. I can promise you, you don't have any idea of how the internet works. Yet, you turn it on, and you're kind of pissed now that the connection speed's not right, or the 
bandwidth isn't there. But if you don't know how the internet works, how does Google make money? Does anybody here have any idea how Google makes money? And it's the purest business model I've ever seen in my life. They sell every ad scrap of information about you, and they sell ads. Wrong. They got you using them. Hmm? They have you using them. What's their business model? Make it easy. Information. Make, make ah, it easy. They're an auction house. Their entire business model is an auction house. Does everybody understand what I mean by Boolean logic? Less than equal to, greater than equal to, if then statements. So if you write code, there's all this right. if then stuff. Same thing with, with Google. Excel. So, for example, when people are looking at their websites, you guys are trying to create a website. What the heck for? What's the purpose of your website going to be? What's the point? People got to know, how are they gonna find your site? That's what Google does, right? Most companies that I deal with have no idea what people type in the search engine to find them. So they had their cousin Vinny do their website because it was cheap. And their website looks like terrible, <laughs> bad, and they don't understand how the web works. Where's the backbone of the web terminated in Houston? And Nope, at the Marathon Oil Building on San Felipe. That is where the backbone of the web is, right? So if we were to log in from here at their terminal over there, we are X number of hops, connection points, off that backbone. We've got to learn how to make money. If we're going to make money, 98% of every customer you deal with goes to your website one way or the other before they'll do business with you. I can promise I've got all the data, knock your socks off. Yet, most people don't really invest in what that is. So Google has the best business model there is. If, if I'm an entrepreneurship and I wanted somebody to find me under Entrepreneur Houston, and I use that as a search term, what do I do? I can go out to Google and I can pay and bid how much I'm willing to spend when someone types in Entrepreneur Houston for me to come up or to be on the ads on the side. I'm paying for placement. I say, my budget's $1,000 a month. I'm not gonna spend any more than 1,000 bucks. I'm willing to bid 82 cents for that search term, so that anytime anybody uses that search term that clicks and finds me, Google charges my account 82 cents. As soon as I have exhausted my $1,000 budget, the next person comes in line, and I gotta start all over again maybe next month. And they're always filling all those search terms and that's why they're trying to own that channel, right? They've turned their noun into a verb. You don't look something up on the internet, you Google it. You don't Bing it, you don't Yahoo it, you Google it, they own the channel now, right? So I'm always into how can I create a monopolistic scenario in the market or markets in which I serve? So I'll give you another example. How many restaurants are there in Harris County? 6,000. Almost 11,000. How many Mexican restaurants? 6,000. <laughs> About 2,750. Okay. Do you think any restaurateur opens up every morning and going, I'm going to corner the market? They've got to settle themselves apart. What's their distinctive confidence? You can look at a Pappas property, which is pretty well run. The dot was their very first property, the dot cap, coffee shop. Or, kid comes to me and he goes, I got an idea. I'm gonna start a restaurant. He said, get out of my office. They all <laughs> fail. Oh, wait a minute, it's gonna have a bar in it. Now get out of my office. <laughs> he goes, oh no, it's gonna have a bar and a restaurant. And I said, what? He said, you got, that's the top three business that can't be financed. Right. You'll never get anywhere. Not gonna happen. I said, but let me give you my idea. All right, so you maybe have seen these. How many restaurants, and I don't call a restaurant in my locus of restaurants, IHOP, Denny's, or any fast food, that doesn't count. That's, that's just nothing. How many restaurants four years ago were open past 10 o'clock at night? Zip. Five. Spanish Flowers was one. Oh yeah. On North Main, right? It's my good yep. list. 
So I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to open up till 3 in the morning, three nights a week. What happens to the kids these days? What time do they go out at night? 11. Uh, they don't even go out till 11. What, are they, what happens at 2? They go or eat. eat. Now what? They're hungry. They're hungry. And when they're hungry and they've been drinking a little bit, do you think they worry about the price? No. I saw a kid chug a bottle of ketchup. <laughs> Where's the crew from all the other clubs and places go eat once they have shut down? So yep. therefore, we're not going after this market. When we build businesses nowadays, we go after this market. I want you to own whatever slice, I don't care if it's a hair, you got to own that. you got to own that. So for example, let me use a real estate example. The person I knew says, I want to get involved in real estate. And I said, great, you better go become a specialist. So what do we do? I set her off. She is now an aging in place specialist. She's certified aging in place. What's happening to our population? Aging. We're all getting older. The bubble's continuing to move older. What are aging in place laws? Now, how wise the door have to be, what access for both bathrooms, ingress and egress to the property, all these issues. Does that mean she can't sell anything else? No. She is an expert in aging in place. Who has disposable income? People our age. Yeah. Ah, people now aren't selling their properties. 54% of all homes in the United States are owned mortgage-free. So if we have that, did you know that? So what that's done is change financing laws and way by which we can deduct certain things. So she's now an aging in place expert. So what does she do? I booked her. She goes to 25 different speaking gigs. There's 74 chambers of commerce in this area. In the senior house. She turns around and becomes talking about aging in place. Everyone's got a mom or dad, or everyone's already in that position. They turn around and say, well, I'd like to talk to you about the aging in place issues and what has to happen if we're going to list our property when we're aging in place. Now, all of a sudden, she's using that angle as a Mitch. hook rather than, I'm in the real estate business. Here's my card with my stupid picture on it. Sorry, but I'm a real business card fanatic. Because most business cards are really bad. Okay? These are the things we have to learn about. These are the things retrospectively. This is why we kill it in our program. Because we don't take any friggin' prisoners. In my program, kids can't wear their pants below They can't wear a hat backwards. They can't ask me a question. They can't be 30 seconds later. They don't get in. Because when, when I get out of school, you don't get an 82 on your loan application. Pass fail. Everything's pass fail. Fish or cut bait. We're gonna fish. Woo. So that's how we roll, and that's what has to happen. So when I start to use this type of scenario, right? If we have guests, they have to wear coat and tie or suits. So what's gonna separate first class from no class? It's these little subtleties that make the huge difference. Competitive analysis. I know what my competitive competitions had for breakfast all we spend our time on. I've got to know exactly what the competitors are up to so I can figure out where my positioning might have to be vis-a-vis -vis that. And some people are happy with what they have. Well, now the question is going to be, a lot of people are spending more resources maintaining what they have than investing in new opportunities. In spite of yourselves, you're going to lose 20% of your customers every year. They die, they move, they get divorced, they go bankrupt. Something happens outside of your control. So therefore, just to break even, we've got to replace 20% of our market. Now, if we're going to grow beyond that, how are we going to grow beyond it? I.e., how do you go get greater share of existing business? How are you going to define growth? Is growth just purely how much money you make? How do you value your customer? Do you look at your apartment complex as what your monthly cash flow is, plus the possible growth in its value? But it's a class C plus, probably a C minus business building. <laughs> that's what we've got to concern ourselves with. And that's what we always want to protect. How do you value a customer? Is the, is the customer valued at the present value worth of all future cash flows that you can forecast? At some sort of discounted rate? How do we determine what that yield needs to be? So for example, a guy comes to me and he goes, there's so many real estate agents. How can I set myself apart? So let me think about that. And here's what we did. We called it Sell Home, C-E-L-L -L Home. So here's what I like. I want, everyone wants immediacy today. They want immediacy. 
So how do I get myself in an advantage listing over anybody else? So here's what we did. We made an agnostic software tool so that you're driving by a house. I want people to see their house at night when daylight savings is switched. I want them to see what traffic's like. Not coming by on Saturday afternoon when Susie baked the cookies is in there. That it's all perfect. And we've turned the garage into part of the flower. I mean, that's a BS. It's, and it's, and it's, it's a bait and switch. So here's what we did. You see that cell number, that text number? Within 15 minutes, we guaranteed you 24-7 at a real estate agent would show. So if you're on call for that period of time, you are on call just like a doctor because our customer is right, not you. This isn't convenient when it's for you. I want it convenient when it's for the customer. So if they want to see it Saturday night at 10 o'clock and you're on duty, you're showing it. Now, we also digitally videoed all the properties that are agnostic as a device. Everyone has a smartphone just about these days. Or you want it text or you want it read to you in various languages, we'll give you the spec. Or if you'd like, right while you're sitting in front of the house, we'll download you the video, so you'll get a virtual tour of the place to see whether you're interested or not. Well, I'll charge the seller $350 to get all that done. You tell me which is a more apt to sell. If I can turn around and, and narrow by 30 days your sell time, now look at the interest carry and all the other things that we've saved. These are the types of angles that we have to be able to have because competition is always trying to put us out of business. So here I get back to my restaurant story. So the kid comes to me and he goes, I want to start a bar and a restaurant. So I shipped him some places around the country and I said, you've got to own your channel of some sort. Make a long story short, our first location was at Montrose and Westheimer, right next to the Valero gas station. Out of 1,100 square feet, which included the kitchen, storage room, lavatories, hall, only 26 cover count, that's 26 chairs only, did a million and one first year. He now has four locations. We just took NIFA's number two location on Westheimer, right next to the House of Pies. That is now BB's Cafe location number four. He's in the Heights on the corner. He's got one of the Heights at White Oak and Studewood. That place will do 3.4 million this year. Yep. He did 600,000 in revenue in three months. He's the number one crawfish. Look at the Chronicle, we got him to be number one late night. We don't want to be all things to all people. So I crafted a phrase, it's now Tex Orleans. We serve Tex Orleans food, okay? So we do all these things because if we're just gonna be a restaurant, screw that. People have too many choices. I want share of wallet. I want them coming once a week or once every two weeks, 52 weeks a year that they get their Mexican fix, they also get their Tex Orleans fix, and it's working. Average entree is less than $11. We are just carving out niches. There's no way you can be all things to all people. You don't have enough capital. You'll go out of business trying to stay in business. It just doesn't work that way. Why well, promise something you can't do? You know, if I tell you the truth, I'll never have to remember what I said. <laughs> so nowadays, guys, is this. We don't do business plans anymore. What a waste, in my view. It's a great experience for someone. I bet none of you have a business plan. You just go do it. You're reactive. You're not proactive in a lot of ways. I'm not meaning that as a criticism. That's just the way most people are. Now we break businesses down into nine segments, very simply, all leading right brain, left brain to the center console here, which is your value proposition. Do you think there's a difference between United Airlines and Southwest Airlines? No. Nope. Yeah. Same 737. What's different? Uh, attitude of the people that work there, blah, blah, blah. All right, let me tell you a true story. In Oklahoma City, a very rotund person had made it past, he was number 27, had made it past the cattle car, was running down, drive, walking down the jetway. He was about to walk into the airplane, and the flight attendant, believe it or not, said, whoa, where are we going today? 27. He goes, sir, this flight is totally booked. There is no way you can fit in one in one chair. You're gonna have to turn around. He got turned away. Tell me what he did. Called his attorney. What did he do? Hmm? 
He was on Southwest. Oh, he was on Southwest. He was number 27 on Southwest. He was number 27 on Southwest Airlines. They turned him away. What did he do? He went somewhere else. Sure. Say, this is your, this is the demographic here, but. No, he got, he got online. That's exactly. Posted. What did he do? On the phone. Believe it or not, he tweeted. None of us, none, I know none of you use Twitter in your marketing. I know you don't. In fact, you don't even know how to use it. <laughs> sure. So you think it's a communist plot. <laughs> yep. Red pinko. Guess what he did? I just got turned down by Southwest Airlines. They called me too fat. Don't call, don't fly Southwest Airlines, blah, 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 blah. Wow. And started walking down back. Guess what happened next? Southwest Within 10 minutes, two people found him gave him one year's free flying, flew him to Houston, had a limousine pick him up. What did he do next? Right. Retweeted, Southwest Airlines really fixes their mistakes. Guys, it's no longer what you do right, it's how you handle wrong. Have you ever read a website where someone says, we provide crappy service? <laughs> Our products are too high? Our price too high? Everyone's full of the same BS. It's how we handle the off that works. It turns out Southwest Airlines has four dedicated people all day, all the time. They work on rotating shifts, nothing but surf the airwaves. Then anytime it's mentioned so that they can turn around and remedy the problem. This is the kind of competitive environment that we're now into. And I'm talking, that's why I teach, man. I got to stay so friggin' sharp because you guys will just take your head off. So I got to stay sharper than they are, which is a challenge these days. So this is what this is. Your value proposition. What do you do? What value do we deliver to the customer? Which one of our customer's problems are we helping to solve? What bundles of products or services are we offering to each customer segment? Okay? I work with a lot of title companies. How do we separate the title company service? What's the closing methodologies? How can we do more simultaneous closes? things that start to separate one from the other so that there's some sort of niche in the marketplace. Therefore, we can increase our yield and our margins because people are price inelastic, meaning demand stays constant without regard to price. So here's an interesting real estate question. When gasoline goes over $4 a gallon, what industry suffers the most? What do I mean when something is price elastic versus price inelastic? For example, when, when gas goes over $4, are you now not going to buy gas? You have to buy gas, you must get there. You're gonna moan about it, but you're gonna buy the gas. Therefore, your non-discretionary expenses have to stay constant. You still have to live in your apartment. You still have to pay for, pay for power. You still have to do those things. So guess what? The restaurant industry goes down 30% in gross revenues when gasoline goes over $4 because people no longer go out. They now must choose a better way to eat that's less expensive because they have to put that discretionary income to fixed expenses. So now, you know what my mantra has been the last two years at the university has been? It's cool to rent because they've everyone's been raised home ownership, home ownership. It's cool to rent. Why tie up your capital in an asset that's not necessarily appreciated when in fact you can turn around and rent them? You don't have to own. It's cool to rent. Well, I'm the national business instructor for the National Kitchen and Bath Association. Okay? 47,000 members. Businesses. Anything having to do with a house. I train everybody on how to run their business because most of them get trained in their craft. They don't know jack about running, reading a financial statement. Right? Wow. Okay. Well, if that's the case, how do we deploy opportunity where opportunity really lies. And this is why it's so important. Now, are all of you using uh, Google Reader? There's so much you can go get for free. Let's just say you're interested in real estate up in spring. I want to be pushed every bit of information about real estate from spring. It's free. You can go just set that up. and It'll come right down to your phone. You can set alarm conditions. I want to know stuff before you know it. Because what you guys really are information brokers. All you are are information brokers. You can yak all day long about how much you know. You only know it if you communicate it clearly. Remember, how many Nigerians live in the city of Houston? 1,400. 60,000. 190,000. 
Okay, I've started three Nigerian restaurants. You never hear of Nigerians. You all wouldn't have anything to do with Nigerians. They, all they do is send those emails. <coughs> but there's a niche. But there is a niche and there's a play. This is why I keep telling you, you got to know that niche and you got to know the play. You can turn around and make a lot of dough. But when you spread yourself too thin, your balance sheets aren't deep enough to be able to pull that off. So this is what we do. What kind of customer relationships are you going to have? How are you going to reach your customer? And what segments are you going after? So for example, now the average home being built new is less than 4,000 square feet. That in fact, there is much more impetus on quality per square foot than there is square footage size. Because the tax base goes based on that, and not in that quality. Really, really interesting, the changes. So for example, I've got some real estate or some people in the kitchen and bath industry only go after houses greater than 4,000 square feet. But this is kind of where we go, okay? I had a kid, I thought this was a brilliant. He sold his idea for a million eight. And that was, he came up with a really cool way to spread fertilizer and insecticide around your house. And that is going through your sprinkler system. So he created an interesting back valve. And what happens is he would give the installation away for free, give the razor away, and he'd sell you these syringes, these giant tubes that were full of water-soluble insect, um, whatever. And then based on what zones you turned on on your sprinkler system, you could put it all out there nice and evenly done. And it didn't get back in the city water supply. Really brilliant, really brilliant. How do we market that? How are we gonna go find our customers? Are we just gonna go door knocking? I said, screw that. Let's go after, let's go down to the city, let's go to the Daily Court Review, the DCR. DCR now sells data. Well, guess what? I want everyone with a second water meter permit. That means they got a sprinkler system and a pool. Wow, there's all our marketing. Now we can rifle our marketing. We don't waste time calling on apartment complex people that aren't going to want to buy something like that. Nothing wrong with that, but that's just not their place. This is where we got to figure out how much are we going to spend to go land that customer and what has to happen. So this side, can you understand what we're talking about? On one sheet of paper with post-it notes, or I have an iPad app. There's an iPad app for this. Number two, over on this side, what activities does the value proposition require that we have to do? What key activities? Distribution channels, customer relationships, what revenue streams, what partners? You can't do things alone anymore. I call it co-opetition. We've got to go ahead and pull a lot of resources because it costs too much money otherwise. And everyone here suffers from entrepreneurial loneliness. You're all going to get in your cars by yourselves. Or you got two or three good ideas out of it. One way or the other, at least if I can germinate a little bit of thought processes, then I'm going to deem that a win. Because right now I'm either intimidating or I'm insulting somebody here. <laughs> and I don't want to do either. Okay? And then, very simply, what are all the revenue streams we could possibly generate? And what are all those costs? That's all there is. We don't have to make this the Magna Carta and the big deal. It's very, very important. Well, to start, we've got to first learn this, communications. We have to be so adaptable on how we communicate. There are different ways, right? Well, She's a tree swing. The customer explained the tree swing exactly like that. <laughs> That's how the project leader understood it. That's how the this oh, wait a minute. That's how the programmer wrote it. That's how the business consultant described it. That's how the project was documented. That's how what operations installed. That's how the customer was billed. That's how it was supported. But really, the customer wanted that. But we're such crappy listeners today. So if you're going to put a website together, for example, you better figure out what it's going to do and how it's going to be updated and what is it you're going to drive, for example, right? So that you can make it worth the effort no matter what it is. I had this kid, this African-American, came into my class one time, hat backwards, down at UH downtown. I kicked his ass out three times in a row. I said, I don't know, and he'd come in late, walking around like that. 
and he started talking ghetto to me. And I said, I'm not going to talk to you if you're going to talk ghetto. All of a sudden, Mr. Eloquent came out. And he said, I can't leave your class. I've got to stay in it. And I said, well, this is what you're going to do. You're going to toe the line, or I'm not going to do it. I'm going to tell you what this kid's done. I'm so proud of him. He has stuck it out. He has now. Texas A&M is where he started. He is doing, guess how the... Guess how the football team has to recruit nowadays? They can't have a coach go drive around and go visit. There's too many rules, et cetera. It's all social media. These guys are putting together all the social media efforts for Texas A&M, 240000 dollars contract you just signed. And then I negotiated for them that they're paying him not to market to UT, Baylor, Oklahoma, and LSU. So he's getting paid not to market. Is now signed University of Maryland. Well, guess who underwrites University of Maryland? Under Armour. The president and CEO of Under Armour went to University of Maryland. They love this so much, they're now underwriting him. He has now gotten Minnesota and he just got TCU. This kid's written a million dollars in business in the last two months. Guess how many employees he has? Zero. Guess how much code he can write? Nothing. He has found his programmers in Germany, Switzerland. He's got one down South America. And he farms it all out and, and facilitates that. And his margins are probably 96%. Wow. Because he's uncovered the pain and have figured out a way to, to monetize that pain. Listen so to that's the what we try to do. So again, everything I do, everything, I build business plans, everything from this point of view. Customer. How many customers have you taken to lunch who turned you down? Now, I want to have lunch with people who don't do business with me. I want to find out what it is I need to do to fix it. I don't want somebody to stroke my ego. I want somebody to beat the crap out of me. That's how we get better. Right? You've got to change your position. I do a whole course called Failure. The entire semester we study failure. Well, we all can speak to failure. It's what you've done with that failure. I want our customers to beat us up all the time. Because that's how we get so much better. Change your point of view. Quit looking at it from your point of view out. Look at how they see you, no matter what business or, or delineation in real estate you might be in. You would agree, branding is everywhere. I usually, in a big audience, have everybody wearing blue jeans stand up. So tons of people stand up. And I say, okay, who spent over $200 for their pair of blue jeans? You wouldn't believe how many women have spent over $200. That just makes my ass look good. It's denim, for God's sakes. Some people are aghast. I spent $19. you got to be kidding me. It's all in the brand. It's all in the brand. How do you turn your noun into a brand? What is it that sets you apart? Right? We don't look something up on the internet. We Google it. We don't make a photocopy. We Xerox it. I want to always think about how I can turn my noun into a verb. A verb. So BBs, man, we're going to go BBs tonight. That's late night dining. That's the kind of thinking we always have. And these big deals I'm working on right now, that's very much the case. Okay? I've got a nanotechnology right now that I could put on a wood fence in your backyard in under five minutes and you will not have any termites. It will repel all water for years and years and years and years and years. It repels salt water. We're looking at boats, docks within 30 miles of the coast. I can go on and on with this nanotechnology. I can put it in paint. Right? So we can come up with all these really cool things. I can put it on those white pants of yours and I can take a bottle of red wine and pour it all over there and you'd have nothing on there. Or your white shirt. Really cool application of science, but how we turn it into money is the challenge. And I have to deal with 75 new patents a year to monetize, which is kind of interesting. So is your life driven by transactions or relationships? Real estate business, it's all about relationships. Listen. It's all about relationships. And how you embed those relationships and nurture those relationships, it's huge. So look at all these brand messages. Are we quality over price, trust over gain, dependable over opportunistic, connected over alone, achiever over procrastinator, fun over boring, 
distinctive over average. Everyone's a legend in their own mind. It's what they say behind your back to me that matters. <laughs> right? And are you good to that word and do you exceed the expectations of your customer? But you go look at all these things about your brand. Racehorse Haynes, you ever heard of Racehorse Haynes? Sure. What's Racehorse Haynes' charge? The guy on death row? What's his fee? Probably zero for the publicity. Nah. There's this deal. Your entire estate. <laughs> if you lose, you're dead. <laughs> if you win, you're alive, but I have your entire estate. If you're on death row, do you really care about the price? You just don't want to croak. You think that is a facetious example. How do you get your services into such a price elastic mode? How do you get people in a class C facility to, to, to uh, line up and still want to be there based on how they're treated? Not how much little you can do, how much more you can do. And they treat them well. Right? Have you ever asked them? Yeah. Ask them all the time. What do we need to do to improve? Some of it's untenable, some of it's not. You have to have that feedback loop all the time. So today, it's all about this. It's all about customer service. It's all about exceeding the expectations of your customers. And how you do that is up to you. It certainly includes marketing, positioning, advertising, and promotion. It includes all your supply chain, your partnerships, software, and now even human resources. It's all about branding. Dress, logo, image, consistency. Fortune Magazine, kids don't grow up wanting to be a rock star or sports hero, they now dream of becoming a leveraged brand. Rock stars don't make money anymore by selling their music, do they? They sell their entire business models based on the peripherals they sell. And they use concerts as lost leaders. So here's this guy. Oh, excuse me, before that, do you guys know that Galveston, Texas changed their name to Galveston Island? Where the sand is brown, lots of kelp. <laughs> and the tar balls are lovely this time of year. Why? Because it's all about that brand. Well, then what happens here? Remember this guy, this mayor of New Orleans? Look what happened. Murders went from 161 to 209, and I quote, it's not good for us, but it also keeps the New Orleans brand out there. <laughs> but now what happened? What did the U.S. taxpayers pay for? An international branding campaign after the hurricane. Soul is waterproof. Normal New Orleans is open to just about anything. Rebranding by innuendo and cliche. That's true. Well, you've never heard of this guy, Dan Syrick. He's a leading authority on litter. Texas was spending $25 million a year cleaning up litter. Do you remember when they had that pitch in campaign? That little, little owl? Hoo hoo, pitch in. Oh, that kind of thing. Well, none of us litter. Upon analysis, Remember back to that niche, we don't go this way, we go this narrow? Well, guess what? They need to go after 18 to 35 year old pickup driving males who like sports hunting and independent women. They like country music, they didn't like authority and are not moved by cuddly owls or pleas. What did they do? <laughs> don't mess with Texas was born. So they brought out Willie Nelson and Jerry Jeff Rock Walker, George Foreman and Stevie Ray Vaughan, and of course Willie Nelson saying don't mess with Texas. After a few months, 73% could recall the uh, campaign I aided. The number of cans dropped 81%. Texas had half the litter of other states. Baba cared about Texas. It's the message, and we've got to rifle it, guys. We cannot shotgun any longer. Shotgunning is just wasting your money. So how do we do all this? Well, of course, it's yeah. how, do we comp how do we compete? We all have 2020 hindsight risk. I should have bought that property. How many times have you had that come to? Man, if I could just bought that property. Back then, man, back in the day, we could have bought that property. Everyone's got their horror and war stories. But it's how we manage this that it's all about. Okay? I go up and have dinner and breakfast with Warren Buffett every year when I take 22 of my students. He doesn't do any deals less than $5 billion now. Okay, nothing. He just bought Heinz. Well, have you ever heard of the Nebraska furniture market? I bet none of you have. Yeah. Yeah? Nebraska Furniture Mart is the largest furniture reseller in the world. They're up in Omaha. They've, they've opened up one of these locations in Kansas City. But wait till you hear this. 
He is spending $1 billion, $400 million on a complex north of Dallas that's going to be on 600 acres. They're expecting 7 million customers a year. There's going to be places to stay. It is going to be the largest under one roof furniture and accessories place in the world. It is under construction right now. It is the third largest, the uh, Exxon place is the second largest construction project in the world right now. That's a billion two. Wow. Look what that's going to do to all the competition and the real estate and all that development. It's going to be, it's truly unbelievable. People will go for the weekend to go shopping. Where's it it is to? going to be crazy. He carries 50 of everything. 50 different vendors. When you walk in, I'm telling you, I've never seen anything like it. It is just amazing. The largest single Apple stores under that roof. Uh, Microsoft, it's crazy. And it's going to do to the furniture business up there, especially what the new theaters did to the old traditional theaters that went away. Right? Now stadium seating, you don't want to go to a place where a guy like me with a big ass head is going to stand in your way and not be able to see anything. You don't want that anymore. Things have changed. So here's an example, a couple of logos, here what some logos might look like now after our recession. <laughs> if none of you get any of these, please raise your hand, I'll explain. Marketing, a flippant, but not bad. <laughs> Marketing drives the sales. Huh? Marketing drives the sales. You can't define it by putting the words in the definition. <laughs> <laughs> no marketing, no sales. You can't put the words in the definition. <laughs> <laughs> Promoting yourself and your product and your service. Promotion versus acquisition All right, and distribution. Well, let's just cut to the chase. <laughs> Marketing is everything you do to generate demand. Everything you do that generates demand. And sales is everything you do to cultivate demand. You can't be a salesman anymore. You can't be order takers. It's how you're filling your pipeline which makes the difference. That's huge. Those require separate, different skill sets than there used to be. You know what I mean by job costing? For example, if I was building six different houses at one time, I would job cost each house so I know how profitable I've been. I would allocate my expenses or my revenues to each piece of property. If you ever calculated in a year's time, how much does tonight's dinner cost you outside of paying for it directly? You got opportunity costs, you have travel time, you've got your time. If you start adding up all the things you spend money on, including your time, in marketing, which is the generation of demand, and you divide that by how many new accounts you get per year, that's how much you're spending to land a new customer. That's how much you're spending to land a new customer. And it's if we can minimize that or maximize its efficiency, that's how you make more money. Because I'm not interested in the top line, I like the bottom line, right? That's what's really, really important. Why? You guys tell me. What do you do when a commercial comes on the radio? Change the channel. You change the channel or you pay for a satellite. You pay for the right not to hear a commercial. 
It's now on your steering column. There's now multiple bands. You jump from thing to thing to thing, to station to station. Tell me what you do on television when a commercial comes on the television. You either fast forward, which is why I, I advise all my clients who do television advertising that if your logo, we got to use the same pixel geography for your logo. So if someone fast forwards your commercial, your logo stayed constant the entire fast forward. <laughs> Because that's what happened. That's exactly right. Because this killer, no. Who wants to run write a commercial? That's why you're seeing product placement in shows now because no one's watching the commercials. Oh, wait a minute. How about the internet? Who likes the pop-up ads? Nobody likes the pop-up ads. You all click out of it. Wait a minute. You can now floss with the Houston Chronicle. It's four pages long. And in fact, their online division, uh, portion is one day beyond their regular web access. Did you know that? Their news feed is 12 to 14 hours lag. 22 newspapers went out of business last year. So here, none of you understand how to use Facebook or Twitter or anything else. You don't really do it much. You just kind of did it back then. You kind of got shamed into it. But you don't really use it as a tool. How much does a billboard cost on the West Loop? 22, 26. Hmm? How's 18,000 a month sound? Sounds about right. 18,000 a month. Why are those properties so huge? Do you know that in Harris County or in the city of Houston, they haven't legislated it yet, but you go outside the city of Houston's limits, you see a lot of digital billboards now. Right? Digital billboards are now reading the RFID tags in cars and have on a fuzzy logic basis putting up uh, an advertisement based on who's driving by. What kind of car? Or All cars now have RFID tags inside them tied to your title, tied to your VIN. I hate to tell you that, big brother. Everybody knows what an RFID tag is? Uh, your toll tag is an RFID tag, radio frequency identification. Okay. Uh, we, we've deployed some of those on ski slopes, so that no longer do you use a ski pass. Now you have an RFID tag, so it can show where you are on the slope, if everybody's down or not, and you can find all your party that you're with. It's kind of neat. So billboards, why are they so popular? You can't turn them off. You cannot turn them off, and that's why they're legislating. In the state of Pennsylvania, for example, they can't run one LED-based billboard longer than six seconds because people are wrecking. Because they're like they're watching television. Pretty crazy. So this is what I always strive for us all to have. How do you achieve superior long-term profit?